Uh, Tori Amos, welcome back to Soundcheck. Thank you, John. So people are evincing a little bit of surprise at this. I'm not surprised. You've been working up to this sort of thing for many years now. Your last record, Midwinter Graces, had a certain classical quality to it uh, at, at times. Do, do you see this as kind of a left turn or, or as a natural progression? Well, I, I think it's a mixture of both. It's doing variations on themes by the masters is always a tricky mm. step just because you can get it very wrong. Well, that, that song uh, is based on a pretty famous piece by Mendelssohn. That's right. The Venetian Boat Song, which is one of his songs without words. That's correct, yes. Uh, how did you go about picking the, the sort of source material? Well, it all started because Deutsche Grammophon approached me to do this project. This is, this is like the ultimate classical music record label. Of all time, yeah, yes. Deutsche yeah. Grammophon. And they have a doctor of musicology, and he's German. Of course they do. Yeah, yeah of course. Right? <laughs> and his name is Dr. Alexander Burr. And he found me out there on the road and said, we um, would like to propose to you an idea for you to compose a 21st century song cycle based on classical themes. And I just looked at him and said, well, are you proposing a drink first? Because this is <laughs> tall order, buddy. <laughs> And so he said, I heard you've been doing a musical, so naturally you should have narrative under your belt. And I mm -hmm. thought, yeah, naturally. <laughs> uh, referring to the light princess? Yes. it's The name is changing because that's really a jumping off point. The musical has become something different. But I've been doing the musical for 5,000 years now. <laughs> and so <laughs> let's hope it's rubbed off on me. <laughs> so, the, uh, so this is a song cycle. Um, and, you know, back in Schubert's day, Hugo Wolf, Robert Schumann, these guys, and, and they were all guys back then. Yes, they were. Uh, would, you know, there'd be a storyline in the, in the text, in the poetry that kind of took you through the song cycle. And characters, normally. Mm -hmm. And usually uh, nature or something uh, like death mm -hmm. has, um, is personified and becomes a character that either threatens or shows the protagonist something that they didn't see when it all started. So, for example, Schubert's famous Winterreise, at the end you have that this incredibly bleak, beautiful song, Der Leiermann, and there's this figure who probably is kind of death yes. personified. So what's the, what's the story, what's the personification that's happening in, in Night of Hunter? Well, I studied Winterreiser, and it seemed to me that we needed to bring nature to life. And um, there is a he in the story. We don't hear his voice uh, vocally. We hear his voice through instrumentation. Mm -hmm. And that was the choice. Uh, I had the orchestrator, John Philip Chanel, to bring the man's point of view to life through the cello and through the um, clarinet. As far as nature... It seemed to me that there needed to be a fire muse. Each of our, um, the man and the woman carry forces. The man has power over tide and wave, and the woman carries the force of fire, which she has abandoned. And this is part of the conflict. So in that song, Nautical Twilight, there's a line about where she has left her world for his. Is that the renouncing of the fire muse power? That is right. Mm -hmm. And she's explaining to Annabelle, who we meet Early on, after the man uh, walks out, glass everywhere, Annabelle, who is a shape-shifting fox-goose creature of nature, appears. Mm -hmm. And she takes the woman back to ancient Ireland. So you have the, the Celtic mythology, this kind of grand context for what is essentially a very personal story of a relationship that is apparently falling apart. Falling apart, yes. We're speaking with Tori Amos, um, and the, this character of Annabelle appears in, in the song the Cactus Practice. Yes. And who is Annabelle? Well, Annabelle is played by my daughter, Natasha, who was 10 at the time of recording, and she said to me she discovered the blues when she was nine. <laughs> And once she did, everything made sense. So I said, okay, well then let's design this around your vocal instrument. That's a precocious kid. So how, how much of this story was in your mind's ear when you set out to, to write this song cycle, and how much of it sort of grew in the telling? Well, I've been reading about 
Irish mythology for many years now, and I guess was always putting it out to the universe that I wanted to to explore it in a project, but it just wasn't working in a pop context. You know, when I was approached by Deutsche Grammophon, it became clear that they did not want a, a kind of rock opera expression, but they wanted it to be modern, and they wanted it to bridge the world. So if you if you have classical themes that are um, very much of that world, but you bring poetry and story and and hopefully arrangements that aren't so um, different from modern times, we're talking about the vocabulary, mm-hmm. then the idea was that you could walk a very thin tightrope between the two worlds. And that was really the idea. Well, now this next song you're going to play for us, Edge of the Moon, uh, this piece based on uh, the the famed Siciliano from the Bach flute sonata. Yes, and it seemed to me if you're going to approach Bach at all, that the only way that the Germans could accept a woman um, approaching the great master is to bring him into a romantic setting. And this is a guy who had like 600 kids, so presumably knew a thing or two about romance. (laughs) One hopes. (laughs) Actually, what did you end up with at the end of the day, Tori? Do you have scores that other pianists and singers could play? or You have scores that you can get on iTunes that uh, the octet scores are there, plus um, contrabassoon. Mm-hmm. The piano scores are not there, so if you're a piano player, you have to wait for a few months till it's all done. That's taking some time. So how different a process was that for you, writing? Well, the, it's a completely different process because I think a song cycle is um, it is a proper form, and you have to look at the blueprint of of why one, a piece can be considered that. And then you, as an architect, you have to approach the work so that that it can be considered that. And the the character whose story we follow in uh, in Night of Hunters is named Tori. Well, I thought it would make it easier for everybody. (laughs) And did it? (laughs) It makes it easier on some days. I think people have been asking how much of this is my real life. And what I would say is that in some ways it's my real life, but over many, many years um, it didn't just happen like it happens in the song cycle. In the course of a single night. Yes, yes. Now, the, the, the story and the song cycle end with this song called Carrie. This is not a Winterreise, you know, kind of ending, is it? It's, it's a little more hopeful than that? Well, it's the 21st century, and the protagonist is a woman. So I thought, um, you know, always that saying, oh, get off the cross, we need the wood. Times are rough. <laughs> <laughs> and so I want women out there and men oh. to kind of think, okay, it, you can turn your life around. Whether she gets back with him or not is up to the listener. But the point made is that there's a level of gratitude of Annabelle that's come into her life, the fire muse, that have given her a vision and strength to face another day as a, more of a whole person than she was before she met them. Uh, I should just make clear, Tori, you're doing voice and piano, which is sort of a classical form of the song cycle back in the That's 1800s. Right. But on the record, it's like a, it's fleshed out with an octet. You've got strings, uh, clarinet, bassoon. Um, has this fired your imagination? Are you thinking of other kind of classical projects? Well, it makes you think about all kinds of possibilities that that isn't traversing old ground necessarily, but expanding into the 21st century. And I think, as the doctor of musicology said to me, composers from all walks, if they have the chops and the ability to build, need to be building forms or in hun- in a hundred years. What will they be playing? They'll keep going back to the 19th century or the early 20th century. And so th- there has to be an expansion of what contemporary composers, what they are and and, and what they're, um, I don't know, giving to the world. 
I'm at a stage where I'm exploring. All right. Tori Amos has been with us on Soundcheck today. It's been a real pleasure having you back on the show. Thank Thanks, you so much. Thank you.